Hello and most welcome to H1138. Sorry, I'm a bit rusty. I have a bit of cold going on. Nothing severe. I hope that my voice will still keep through the lecture. I will talk about connectivity theory today and I will also mention something called neuroimaging which is very close to connectivity theory. Uh, thanks to Henrik for the tip of connectivity theory uh, and I will start with Carl Friston. This is probably the best to start with the most difficult thing. Neuroimaging is a new scientific area. It's very hard to put it into a slot, so to speak, or a slit to make some pun with a double slit experiment. And we start. Carl Friston, I think you heard about before, is uh, an excellent neurologist. Uh, writes incredibly clear for being an advanced scientist. I really like his style, but it's still it's very complicated. We are now entering into the Klein bottle. And simultaneously, he's sort of describing the outer world and the inner world. But that, I would say, takes a little getting used to. The article is was firstly presented in in a, at a colloquium entitled "Neuro Imaging of Human Brain Function." <clears throat> and this was organized by Michael Postner and Marcus E. Rakel in May 29 to 31. Imagining neuroscience principles or maps. To make a complete summary, when I think, is that an image or is it a principle? Is it words or is it picture? And we discussed this previously when it comes to the Alexander te technique. When I think, uh, let the neck be free so the head can go forward and up and widening and deepening your back. Is that something you imagine or is there su such a thing as just hearing it? Well, let's go into it and see. Carl Friston has to say about this. <clears throat> Imagining neuroscience, principles or maps. Abstract. This article reviews some recent trends in imagining neuroscience. A distinction is made between making maps of functional responses in the brain and discerning the rules or principles that underlie their organization. After considering developments in the characterization of brain imaging data, several examples are presented that highlight the context-sensitive nature of neuronal responses that we measure. These contexts can be endogenous and physiological, as I mentioned, it could be endogenous inside, reflecting the fact that each cortical cortical area or neural population 
expresses its dynamics in the context of interactions with other areas. <coughs> Conversely, these contexts can be experimental, experimental, or psychological, and can have a profound effect on the regional effects elicited. In this review, we consider experimental designs and analytic strategies that go beyond cognitive subtraction and speculate on how functional imaging can be used to address both the details and principles underly underlying functional integration and specialization in the brain. An imagining neuroscientist who wants to understand some of the organizational principles that underlie brain function is faced with a great challenge. Imagine that we took you to a forest and told you, tell us how this forest works. Many scientists are interested in this forest and study it using a variety of techniques. Some study a particular species of flora or fauna, some its geography. You won't have time to talk to them all about, but you can read what they write in specialist journals. We should warn you, however, that many have specific interests and tend to study only the accessible parts of the forest. I can imagine, Henry, you already understand where this is leading, but I will not make a spoiler. You accept the challenge, and to make things interesting, we place two restrictions on you. First, you can only measure one thing, Second, although you can make measurements anywhere, you can only take them at weekly intervals. This problem is not unlike that facing neuroimaging. Of all the diverse aspects of neural dynamics, imagining, imagining is only sensitive to hemodynamic response. It is a distal measure of neural activity and these measurements can only be made sparsely in time <coughs> faced with measurements can only be made faced with a forest problem one would acquire data generating map after map of measured variable one might try to make some inferences about regional differences. And try to understand the changes measured initially at any one point and then in the context of changes elsewhere. These measures might be related to meteorology meteorological changes, seasonal variations, and so on. In short, one will make maps and then try to characterize their dynamical behavior. What, however, is the primary objective? Is it the construction of detailed maps, or is it the interpretation of the dynamics in terms of simple rules or principles that govern them. We suggest that both aspects are crucial and develop this argument further in relation 
to recent trends in functional neuroimaging. This article is divided into four sections. In the first, we review some of the general motivations behind imagining neuroscience in terms of the distinction between making maps of functional anatomy and the principle that emerges from them. In the second section, we review the way in which the models or tools used to analyze data are likely to develop. In the third and fourth sections, we introduce some specific examples relating to, relating to functional integration and the different sorts of regionally specific brain responses that can be characterized. Principles or maps. Functional maps in neuroimaging rely on identifying areas that respond selectively, selectively to various aspects of cognitive and sensory motor processing. These maps are likely to become successively more refined. On the one hand, they will contain more detail as the resolution of the techniques employed increases. The spatial resolution of functional magnetic resonance imaging, this is very important, it's called an FMRI. Do remember that because I mentioned that thing so many times. It is crucial. Functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's MRI and with an added F in the beginning. Very important. Do not forget that one. is already sufficient to discern structures like the thick, thin and interstripe organization within V2. Temporal resolution is in the order of seconds and can be supplemented with magnetic, magneto and electrophysiological information at a millisecond level. So F is what adds the temporal section. An ordinary MRI is just one instant. This is over time. And this is why I think it's so important that you remember that. Because I mentioned it before, and it's bound to turn up again and again and again. It's very important also in the scripture of Ian McKilchrist, and this is sort of the spearhead of modern neurology. That is the FMRI. It shows incredible things. <clears throat> the second sort of refinement may be in terms of the taxonomy of regionally specific effects themselves. Neuroimaging to date largely has focused on activations. However, Regionally specific effects not only conform to a taxonomy based on anatomy, i.e. which anatomical area is implicated. But also in relation to the nature of the effect. An example of this is the distinction between regionally specific activations 
and regionally specific interactions, that is context sensitive activations observed in factorial experiments. One, a further extension of mapping is into the domain of interactions or connections among area, areas. Although prevalent in the context of anatomical connectivity, two, maps of functional or effective connections have yet to be established. The latter is likely to be more complicated than their anatomical equivalents by virtue of their dynamic and context-sensitive nature. Map making per se is not only is not the only aspect of imaging neuroscience. Understanding the principles or invariant features of these maps and their associated mechanism is an important aim. There is a distinction between identifying an interaction, e.g. between two extratriate areas and the principles that pertain to all such interactions. For example, there is a difference between demonstrating a model, modu modulatory influence of posterior parietal complex on V5, the human homologue of primate area MT, and the general principle that backward projections from higher order areas are more model modulatory than the forward counterparts. Note, however, that this principle would depend on fully characterizing all the interactions among extratriate areas. This reiterates the importance of cartography in this instance, a cartography of connections. Another example of principles that derive from empirical observations can be taken from the work of complexity theorist. Here you go, Henrik. Wherein certain degrees of connectivity at the level of gene-gene interaction give rise to complex dynamics. Three, this principle of sparse connectivity has emerged again in relation to the complexity of neuronal interactions. What are the sorts of principles that one is looking for in imagining neuroscience? The principle of functional specialization is now well established and endorsed by human neuroimaging studies. If we define functional specialization in terms of anatomically specific responses that are sensitive to the context in which these responses are evoked, then by analogy functional integration can be thought of as anatomically specific interactions between neural populations 
that are similarly context sensitive. In a sense, functional integration is a principle, but it is not very useful. Examples of more useful principles might include a principle of sparse connectivity, e.g. functional integration is mediated by sparse ex extrinsic connections that preserve specialization within systems that have dense intrinsic connections. Or that in relation to forward connections, backward connections are modulatory. In summary, a detailed empiricism is a prerequisite for the emergence of organizational principles. For some neuroscientists, the principles themselves might be the ultimate goal. But these principles will only be derived from maps of the brain. For others, relating the maps to cognitive architectures and psychological models may be the ultimate goal, but this in itself requires a principled approach. Next paragraph, models or tools. In this section, we consider the status of various models that are used to analyze or characterize brain function and how they are likely to develop. The models one usually come across in neuroscience are of three types. First, there are biologically plausible neural networks of or synthetic neural models. Five. Second, are the mathematical models employed in linear and nonlinear systems identification. And third, are the statistical models used to characterize empirical data. Six. This section suggests that the increasing sophistication of statistical models will render them indistinguishable from those used to identify the underlying system. Similarly, synthetic neural models that are currently used to emulate brain systems and study their emergent properties will lend themselves to reformulations in terms of those required for system identification. The importance of this is that, one, the parameters of synthetic neural models, for example, the connection parameters and the time constants, can be estimated directly from empirical observations, and two, the validity of statistical models in relation to what is being modeled will increase. Another way of looking at the distinctions between the various sorts of models and how this, these distinctions may, might be removed is to consider that we use models either to emulate a system or to define the nature or form of an observed system. When used in the latter context, <coughs> The empirical data are used to determine the exact parameters 
of the specified model where in statistical models inferences can be made about the parameter estimates. In what follows we will review statistical models and how they may develop in the future and then turn to an example of how one could derive a statistical model from one normally associated with, very important, non-linear system identification. The importance of this example is that it shows how a model can be used not only as a statistical tool but as a device to emulate the behavior of the brain under a variety of circumstances. Linear models the most prevalent model in imagining neuroscience is the general linear model. This simply expresses the response variable, e.g. hemodynamic response, in terms of a linear sum of explanatory variables or effects in a design matrix. Inferences about the contribution of these explanatory variables are made in terms of the parameter estimates or QF coefficients, coefficients, coefficient, coefficients estimated by using the data. There are a number of ways in which one can see the general linear model being developed in neuroimaging, for example the development of random and mixed effect models that allow one to generalize inferences beyond a particular group of subjects studied to the population from which the subjects came. Or the increasingly sophisticated modeling of evoked responses in terms of wavelet D composition. Here we will focus on two examples. One, model selection. Two, inferences about multiple effects using statistical parametric maps of the functional statistics, SPMF. And remember that functional statistics is the temporal thing. And this is Carl Friston's fantastic uh, combination. We have the now movement or the brain movement or the new imaging and we also have past and future and that puts us pretty close to reality itself. Generally when using statistical models one has to choose from among a hierarchy of models that embody more and more effects. Some of these effects may or may not be present in the data and the question is which is the most appropriate model? One way to address this question is to see whether adding extra effects significantly improved uh, one can see elaborate one way to address this question is to see whether adding extra effects signific significantly reduces the error variance. When the fit is not signific significantly improved, one can cease elaborating the model. This principle approach to model selection is well established in other fields and will probably prove useful in URI imaging. One important application of model selection is the context of parametric designs and character characterizing evoked hemodynamic response in, listen now, F 
M R I. In parametric designs, it is often the case that some high order polynomial expansion of the interesting variable. Seven, e.g. the rate of duration of stimulus presentation. is used to characterize a non-linear relationship between hemodynamic response and this variable similarly in modeling evoked responses in F, M or I. The use of expansions in terms of temporal basis functions has proved useful. These two examples have something in common. That is a, they both have an order that has to be specified. The order of the polyno polynomial regression approach is the number of high order terms employed and the order of the temporal basis function expansion is the number of the basis functions used. Model selection has a role here in determining the most appropriate or best model orders. Models that use expansion bring us to the second example. Recall that in general the contribution of designed effects is reflected in the parameter estimates of the coefficients relating to these effects. In the case of polynomial expansions or temporal basis functions, these are the set of coefficients of the high order terms or basis function. Unlike simple activations, or effects corresponding to a particular linear combination of the parameters, parameter estimates. Inferences based on these high order models must be a collective inference about all of these with, uh, coefficients together. This inference is made with the F statistics and speak to the usefulness of the SPMF as an inferential tool. The next section presents an example of the SPMF in action and introduces models used in a non-linear system identification. Those two are very important. It's a non-linear system identification. Did you know that this was the state of new imaging that it was using non-linear identification processes. To me, it's a grand surprise. Non-linear models. Now we get to the cheesy thing here. How can we best characterize the relationship between stimulus presentation and the evoked hemodynamic response in FMRI. Hitherto the normal approach has been to use a stimulus waveform that conforms to the presence or absence of particular stimulus attribute. Convolve, i.e. smooth, this with an estimate of a hemodynamic response function and see if the result can predict what is observed. 
using an estimate of the hemodynamic response function assumes that we know the nature or form of this response and furthermore precludes nonlinear effects. Wow. A more comprehensive approach would be to use nonlinear system identification and pretend that the stimulus was the input and that the observed hemodynamic response was the output. This approach posits a very general form for the relationship and uses the observed inputs and outputs to determine the parameters of the model that optimize the match between the observed and predicted hemodynamic responses. The approach that we have adopted uses a Volterra series expansion, H. This expansion can be thought of as a non-linear convolution and can be shown to emulate the behavior of any non-linear time invariant dynamical system. Wow! The results of this analysis are a series of Volterra kernels of increasing order. The zero order kernel is simply a constant. The first order kernel corresponds to the hemodynamic response function usually arrived at a linear analysis and the second and higher order kernels embody the non-linear dependencies of response on stimulus input. By using a series of mathematical devices second order approximations and expansion of the coefficient coefficients in terms of temporal basis function, we are able to reformulate the Volterra series in terms of the general linear model and use standard techniques to estimate and make statistical inferences about these kernels. An example of the kernel estimates for a voxel in a periodicary cortex is shown in figure 1. The estimate was based on a parametric study of evoked responses to words presented at varying frequencies and is fairly typical of non-linear hemodynamic response function. The associated SPMF shown in a standard anatomical space testing for the significance of Volterra kernels and Uta Bene we are not speaking about kernels with a CU but it is kernels with K E R and E L And the significance of Volterra kernels is shown in figure 2. Uh, I just described the kernels. Uh, you see clearly in the first imagery that there is a peak and clearly that is shown the non-linear working of the brain function that is not linear but non-linear. Do you remember that? And since this is from an F MRI, I would say this is a proof that thinking is in itself non-linear. Very important. Figure 2, there you see a kernel, a uh, kernel more or less like a shana. Uh, at this point we could conclude that evoked responses show 
a highly significant non-linear response and present a characterization of this response in terms of the kernel coefficients. Figure 1. However, we can go further and use the parameter estimates to specify a model that can be used to emulate responses to a whole range of auditory inputs. As an example, consider the response to a pair of words that are presented close together in time. Remember phonetics as distinct from when they are presented in isolation. Figure 3 demonstrates the result of this simulation and shows that the presence of a prior stimulus attenuates the response to a second. The key thing to note here is that we are performing virtual experiments on the model, presenting it with stimuli that were never actually used. Indeed, we can determine the model's response to a single word. The results of this analysis are shown in Figure 4, along with the empirically determined responses from a real experiment where single words were presented in isolation. In conclusion, the distinction between models that are used solely to confirm our predictions about the observed brain responses may, in the future, become sufficiently unconstrained and general as to provide the basis for simulated experiments. Functional integration in the brain. One overriding aspect of the brain is its connectedness, suggesting that the interactions and relationships between activity in different parts of the brain may be as important as regionally specific dynamics. Perhaps what we search for is a functional art architecture as opposed to a functional anatomy, where the archi texture embodies the interactions and integration that bridge between the dynamics of specialized areas. In what follows, we consider a number of developments in neuroimaging that relate to functional integration and effective connectivity among specialized areas. Effective connectivity. Functional integration is usually inferred on the basis of correlations among measurements of neural activity. However, correlations can arise in a variety of ways. For example, in multi-unit electrode recording, recordings, they can result from stimulus-locked transient, transients evoked by a common input or reflect stimulus-induced oscillations mediated by synaptic connections. Integrations with, within a distributed system is usually better understood in terms of effective connectivity as distinct from the correlations themselves. Effective connectivity refers explicitly, explicitly to the influences that one neural system exerts over another. 9. Either at a synaptic, i.e. synaptic efficacy, or population level, 
there are two important aspects of effective connectivity. One, effective connectivity is dynamic, i.e. activity and time dependent. Two, it depends on a model of interactions. Two very important things to remember. To date, the models employed in functional neuroimaging have been inherently, inherently linear. And I would say that is still the case in, let's see, half of what neurology is still doing in 2022. So Carl Friston is the name to be remembered. There is a fundamental problem with linear models. They assume that the multiple inputs to a region are linearly separable and do not interact. This precludes dynamic or activity-dependent connections that are expressed in one sensory-motor sensory motor or cognitive context and not in another. The resolution of this problem lies in adopting non-linear models that include terms that model the interactions among inputs. These interactions can be construed as context or activity dependent modulations of the influence that one region exerts over another. <coughs> This is an important point, suggesting that the second order models represent the minimum order necessary for a proper characterization of context sensitive interactions. One approach to these characterizations involves an extension of the above nonlinear model of hemodynamic responses that employed the Volterra series. In this instance, instead of considering the nonlinear response to stimulus input, we replace the stimulus with activities measured in other parts of the brain. The Volterra kernels, which mediates the influences of distant regions, provide a comprehensive model of effective connectivity. These estimates are, as above, expressed in terms of kernel coefficients and inferences can be made about their significance using standard statistical techniques. Although we will not go into details here, these sorts of analysis provide measurements of the direct and modulatory influences of one region on another. <coughs> 
and a p-value associated with these effects. <coughs> a typical example of the connectivity that is obtained from this sort of analysis is shown in figure 5. This analysis was based on an F, M or I study of visual motion. This is visual motion. Subjects were presented with radially moving stimuli under different attentional conditions. These results demonstrate the role of the posterior parietal cortex in modulating the effective connections to the motion sensitive area. V5 that may mediate the attentional modulation of responses to its input. This attentional modulation represents a context sensitive change in the effective connections to V5. And now we come to the next paragraph here, psychophysiological interactions. Modulation and context sensitive changes in effective connectivity are, uh, are important aspects of functional integration. Psychophysiological interactions refer to the interaction between some psychological or experimental context and physiological activity measured somewhere else in the brain. <coughs> the idea here is to try and explain the responses observed at one point in the brain in terms of an interaction between the apparent stimuli, apparent imp, afferent input from another region, and some design stimulus specific or cognitive variable. Generally, interactions are expressed in terms of the effect of one factor on the effect of another. Psychophysiological interactions, therefore, can be looked at from two points of view. First, a psychological or sensory factor can affect or modulate the physiological influence on one brain area on another. Second, the same interaction can be construed as modulation of a target area's responses to the sensory or cognitive changes by modulatory influences from the source area. The empirical example that we have chosen to illustrate this involves the FMRI study mentioned above of attention to visual motion. In this study, subjects were asked to view radially moving dots that gave the impression of optic flow. In between these stimuli, the subject simply viewed a fixation point. On alternative presentations of the moving stimuli to the subjects was asked to attend to changes in the speed in the stimuli. These changes in speed did not actually occur. We were interested in whether attention could be shown to modulate the influence on the v, V1 through V2 complex on V5. We addressed this by regressing the activity at every voxel. On that in V1 through V2, under the attentional states separately, under two attentional states separately. Wow, this is rather complicated. <laughs>
we tested the significance of the difference in the resulting regression slope, i.e. the psychophysiological interaction between V1 through V2 complex activity and attentional set. To give an SPMT, that is significant, P is more than 0 0.05 voxels, are shown in white on the structural T1 weight MRI in figure 6 upper and correspond to region in the vicinity of V5. The lower panel shows an example of the regression for the most significant voxel in this region and demonstrates that when subjects were expecting to detect changes in the motion of a visual stimulus, the regression slope was markedly steeper. In other words, the influence of V1 through V2 on V5 was positively modulated by attention to this aspect of visual motion. Let us look again at the two regression slopes in figure 6. Recall above that there are two inter interpretations of psychophysiological psycho reactions. One, the context-specific change in the influence or connectivity between two regions. Or two, a modulation of responsiveness by this influence. The first interpretation is more natural in this context in the sense that attention can be thought of as modulating the influences that V1 through V2 exerts over V5. However, the complementary perspective is equally valid. In this instance, attention-dependent responses in V5 are realized only in the presence of stimulus-dependent input from V1 through V2. This approach obviously can be extended to include nonlinear effects and embrace more complex interactions. However, the principles will be the same. <clears throat> now we come to a very juicy part here. Event-related, state-related, and context-sensitive brain responses. Event-related fMRI. Since the advent of fMRI, a new distinction have, have, has emerged in neuroimaging, namely that between event and state related measurements. Event, it's temporal, state is non temporal. Before the F MRI, it could only be state. By virtue of the half life, life of the radioactive traces used in positron emission uh, tum uh, tomography, PET we have been confined largely to studying differences in brain states engendered by the repeated presentation of stimuli or the enduring performance of some tasks. But that all changed with the FMRI. With FMRI, new techniques currently are being developed that allow the evoked responses to single stimuli or events to be characterized and compared. This is of fundamental importance for experimental design because the facility to present experimental trials in isolation frees one from the potentially confounding effects of things like attentional set. <clears throat>
For example, we now can look directly at the brain's response to novel events in oddball paradigms and more generally disambiguate the effects of particular stimulus from the context in which the stimulus was presented. See below. Figure 7 make a distinction between state and event related brain responses by using a single subject FMRI study in which the subject was asked to listen to words presented at a fixed rate over an extended period of time or to single words presented in, an, in isolation. These analyses represent a simple version of the Volterra series approach described above and rely on the use of temporal basis functions. Event-related FMRI now presents the opportunity to adopt the same sorts of experimental designs that have proved so useful in evoked potential work in electrophysiology. Now we go to context-sensitive responses in PET. Perhaps it's worth considering event-related re PET. It is not necessary to measure individual responses to stimuli to make inferences about them. We will briefly review two examples where PET has been used to examine the transient responses evoked by words and where these responses have to be considered in the light of the context which they were presented. In the first example, words were presented visually at a fixed rate during PET scanning. The only variable was the exposure duration of the stimuli which varied between 150 and 750 milliseconds. Uh, ex responses in the extractrate cortex showed a monotonic increase with exposure duration. By using this parametric design in conjunction with a nonlinear regression analysis, we were able to show that the evoked responses deviated from a linear relationship with relatively attenuated responses at a longer duration at longer durations. These observations have two potential explanations. First, extractrate responses to visually presented stimuli are preferentially enhanced by attentional mechanisms when the stimuli are very brief. This interpretation was supported by the observation that activity in the anterior cingulate was maximal at the shortest expo exposure durations. The second explanation is that there is intrinsic adaption during sustained visual presentation, resulting in a progressive fall in the average response with increasing expo exposure duration. These alternative explanations provide a good example of where event-related FMRI could be used to adjust 
adjudicate between them by repeating the experiment with event-related fMRI, one can remove the attentional influences and determine whether adaption does indeed occur. Wow! In the second example, we are subjects to produce words at a variety of rates. This was a factorial design in that the words were either generated intrinsically, beginning with a heard letter, or extrinsically by simply repeating the letter. Either they heard or they repeated it. By looking for an interaction between the nature of word production and word production rate, we identified a region in the posterior temporal cortex that increased with extrinsically generated word rate. The latter observation is remarkable and suggests that activity is reduced when more of these word production events occur. <clears throat> the only explanation for this is a true deactivation or a reduction in brain activity associated with the intrinsic production of each word. Now we get to context-sensitive activations and interactions. Think of connectivity here. It's very, very good. Think of connectivity, how exterior, interior are connected in a non-linear fashion. And that will sort of preclude my, spoiler alert, conclusion that both reality and thinking is non-linear and that stringent thinking is not what we used to think it is. But we'll come to that soon. Just wait for it. Context-sensitive activations and interactions. Many of the more compelling neuroimaging experiments have employed factorial designs, wherein the interaction among the factors used has been as interesting, if not more so, than the effects of the factors themselves. In terms of future trends, it might be anticipated that factorial designs will become more important. Well, I can tell you that they were to the extent that brain responses are always more context-sensitive than many effects that hitherto have been ascribed to simple activations by cognitive or sensory processes may in fact reflect interactions between these processes and the context in which they were elicited. Consider the following example. Imagine that we have discovered extratriate activations when subjects viewed words as opposed to false font letter strings. We might describe this activation to the difference between the stimuli and label the region as word form area. However, this regionally specific effect could be an interaction between implicit phonological retrieval and the visual processing of letter strings. To demonstrate this, one would need a factorial design in which the presence of, a letters, of letter strings was crossed 
with implicit phonological retrieval. retrieval. On the basis of this experiment, we might find that the region responded to the presence of letter strings relative to single characters, and that this activation was enhanced by implicit phonological retrieval. That is, when implicitly naming the word or letter. In other words, we could also construe this regionally specific effect as a modulation of letter string specific responses by implicit phonological retrieval, retrieval. In the absence of phonological retrieval, there may be no differences in the response of this area to words or non-words letter strings. This distinction between word-specific responses in an ex extra striate region and word recognition dependent modulation of extrite responses to any letter string is not a specious one. Specious one. Specious means typical. I think. The two interpretations are that there are one, receptive fields for words in extratriate regions or <coughs> two, a selective modulation of receptive fields for any letter string by higher cortical areas with receptive fields for the phonology of the stimulus. If we were to inhibit the activity of these higher order areas using, for example, magnetostimulation, which is this, you put uh, an impedance over the brain and stimulate certain areas or the whole brain, the extractorate responses might no longer differentiate between word-like and non-word-like letter strings. If this were the case, should the extractorate area be designated a word form area? Clearly not in a simple way. However, it would constitute a necessary component of a distributed system involved in the perception of visually presented words. From a psychological perspective, one could posit a psychological component that was responsible for the integration Very interesting. The in I have to reread -re this. The interaction that between phonological retri retrieval and the visual analysis of letter strings, letters random, would then represent an activation on comparing brain activity in states, states that did and did not have this integration. Factorial designs represent represent one way of identifying these integrative or context-sensitive activations. In summary, this example highlights the importance of regionally specific interactions and factorial designs. One interpretation of interactions is that they represent the integration of different processes, e.g. visual processing of letter strings and phonological retrieval in a dynamic and context-sensitive fashion. In conclusion, we have reviewed the importance of context-sensitive effects in neuroimaging 
both from the perspective of functional integration and effective connectivity and from the perspective of functional specialization and the integration of componential and co cognitive and sensory-motor processing. Advances in the design and analysis of brain imaging experiments are revealing the nature and the role of these effects. Yes, that was a very complicated paper. I will try to take out the zest of it here now. Well, first, well, let me make a list. I'll put a short pause here. Well, we mentioned this many times before, uh, and now I come to the conclusion of the summary of the marvelous article by uh, Carl Friston and others. Uh, we all know that thinking is non-linear, but what we believe to be thinking, that is linear thinking, is not thinking in the moment. It's not a functioning thinking, it is an after effect. It's after what happened. So it's an imitation, I don't know what to call it, I call it a shadow here, of proper thinking. So instead of, uh, as we assumed earlier on, and most of uh, science of cognition assumed, that there are two types of thinking, non-linear and linear, there is only the non-linear and the non-linear is all what we think linear is all and yet more whereas what we usually call linear thinking is not step-like we assume it to be so because we have no way of being aware of it it's a shadow effect this is another way of showing uh, what Ben Libet showed that the consciousness thinking as he called it I would call it reflective consciousness or the ego self is after the fact there is zero linearity with regular linear thinking nothing at all because it happens afterwards and it's an imitation it's a shadow but since it's happening after the fact that shadow is useless for predi predication, it's useless for understanding, it actually takes you away from reality, so to speak. Instead, Carl Friston showed that there is, in many cases, a very clear difference between looking at a random set of uh, letters and something that actually means something. But for the linear thinking, there is no difference. The linear thinking cannot read off the world. It just repeats it, so to say, so to say phonologically internally or even externally phonological. How can one understand that? Well, think about how young people, children, <laughs> is a better word for that, the correct word for young people is children in this case. We learn to read by using our mouth. We imitate the words, we imitate the letters and therefore we sound out the words and little by little we can pronounce in the end the words. It is very likely that that can become a secondary thinking or an imitation of thinking. Why is that? 
Well, you sound out the thinking in your head, just like you sound out words. And in the sounding out process, if you expose a child, if you are a bit devious or devilish, you can give them words that doesn't mean anything. They would still sound them out. So regular ego self thinking is like that. It's an imitation, but it doesn't carry meaning. There is no functional difference in the FMRI. Very important. And this wasn't possible to see before the advent of the fMRI. The MRI has been around for quite some while, but the fMRI, it is an expansion of the MRI in all directions, up, down, and back and forth. By having the temporal uh, sequence, you can see when thing happens. You couldn't see that before. And you can see exactly how perceiving something that is meaningful leads to understanding of meaning. Whereas this repetitious symmetrical thinking or linear thinking that they used to call it, which I now understand is a horribly bad name, it is just a shadow effect. It is sounding out the thinking inside the head. And some I, some instances I do that myself. I repeat words when I do things. And that is imitating thinking. And I noticed, I try to avoid to do it, but because it doesn't help me, never helps me. Uh, it's a sign of stress maybe, it's a confusion, it is, an, uh, what, what is that word? like birds do if you frighten them or they get confused, they do something else like pick their feathers uh, to take away the energy. Our regular thinking, the ego self thinking, is that it's a stress reaction and we try to imitate thinking and my bet is that we take that process of sounding out words we learned in school and thereby sounding out thoughts because there is a very close connection to verbal miming and phonology and thinking. This indeed, if read by one of my heroes, would have been of immense help. And that person is Edward de Bono. He stipulated two thinkings. For obvious reasons, this is what we all think about thinking until recently, and that is that there are two different ones. So just let me read a couple of chapters from his book, it's in Swedish, so excuse me if I sort of translate in the moment, but it will be well worth it. It came to a surprise to me until recently I haven't understood this. But there are very interesting thing, things coming from the fMRI. It is uh, quite a marvelous construction. This is his second best book called Real Creativity. It came out later than my favorite book. This came in 92. Uh, its original title in English is Serious Creativity. And it's later than his philosophical book, You Are R I Am Right, You Are Wrong how to break the black and white thinking. And this is a tryout to make uh, that rather heavy, under, uh, heavy thinking that is in uh, I'm Right, You Wrong book. But it pretty much says the same thing. And here, page 30, he tries to establish what would have been so helpful for him to, to use Carl Friston's and the fMRI, but it's, it's a trying to 
get into what thinking is. Misunderstanding about creative thinking. Uh, the idea, the first thing, the first misunderstanding is that the creative skill is inborn and cannot be trained. It's a very comfortable misunderstanding since it liberates us from ever having to do anything to develop our creativity. If creativity is just a question about natural skill, so there is nothing I can do. And there are often famous examples with extreme creative people like Mozart, Michelangelo, Einstein. And it could be almost like saying there is no use in educating people in thinking, mathematics, physics, since there are only few people who are like Einstein or Poincaré. But we don't stop to teach our children to play the piano or the violin just because we cannot guarantee they are not are, are not going to be a new list of Paderewski. All small tennis player cannot become Björn Borg or Martina Navratilova, or for that matter, Roger Federer. Well, he, he points to something really important here, and that is most people think today that creativity is inborn. And I think he says this is a misunderstanding. I would say it is not a misunderstanding, because since we have that misunderstanding of what thinking is, uh, I would say creativity is not reachable and it's not something you can train. Until that moment you understand that your linear thinking, your step-by-step -step thinking is not linear and it's not step-by-step. -step. It's not taking you anywhere. It is like the wishful thinking and it's wishful thinking, it's not, it's not thankfulness to use a Deridian word. A second one he wants to attack is that rebels are creative, like punks, people who go against the stream. And then he goes to the uh, left and right hemisphere, and I think this is very good. This precludes what later was to come with Ian McIlchrist. This book is from 1992. Uh, and uh, he points to that we should use the right hemisphere, I mean, McGilchrist indirectly or his predecessors. And he says that it is possible to investigate which part of the brain are working with a, in a certain instance with a so-called PET uh, investigation or uh, Posit positron emission tomography, PET investigation. We, we are done making movies about small flashes of radioactivity, some shows the brain's activity. This is before the FMR, the FMRI, which is interesting in itself. And he says, he concludes that the Partitioning of the right and left hemisphere has some certain significance, but not much. The false misunderstanding is that artist and creative thinking goes hand in hand. Try to paint, try to write poetry, and you will regain your creative thinking. He says this is a misunderstanding as well, and I quite agree, and I think Carl Friston would do as well. And another thing which I recognize is that you can sort of liberate yourself from your restricted logical thinking and then sort of step into creativity. That's a misunderstanding as well. And the sixth one is that you can use your intuition. And I think we all know that is a complete misunderstanding. Complete misunderstanding. Intuition 
Intuition is just sheer chance and it will often lead to incredible problems. But we often use intuition today and of course that becomes much, even much clearer uh, with what we now know about thinking from Carl Christen and others that the after effect thinking won't lead you anywhere. It's like you had a skill and you lost it and you tried to imitate it and you build it up in quite a different way. I would say we build it up with what we take to be generalized contradictions and then afterwards we name that thinking. But it's not thinking. We can reach into true thinking because we still use it at some instances. We can never get rid of that, then we will stop functioning completely. But the linear or the top-down thinking is a myth. But there is also a very good explanation because we have that myth. And it is because it is deeply grounded in experience. What we experience as thinking is the idea we look at something and then we ponder it. But do remember Benjamin Libet. He has proven, and many experiments after that, that we do not possess thinking. It's like pointing to the reflective consciousness itself. It's an after effect. It's after the fact. And I would say this goes secondarily, hand in hand, why people cannot understand quantum mechanics. Because in that stricter system of building up things after the fact, everything about creativity, innovation, newness, becomes just that. Newness, innovation, not proper parts of reality. A shadow effect is in itself stable, static, unchangeable, it is like a photograph you take of the world and you use that to orient yourself. And you will understand in the very same moment you move one step, that photo will not show reality. It had showed reality at some instant, but it doesn't any longer. And we are all using that shadow effect. We cling in, in onto it because we have nothing else. But at some instances, we still do thinking, and it's covered up by this idea of what thinking is. And this was maybe his main problem, Edward de Bono, to defend what he called asymmetrical thinking. But as long as there is a symmetrical thinking, a proper thinking, or logic thinking, if that idea is still around, it will haunt us and we will see asymmetrical thinking as the exception. It is not. Asymmetrical thinking contains everything of logical linear thinking, but yet it's much, much more. It is what makes linear thinking. Remember that. We know for sure from fMRI that what makes up linear thinking is something before and has all aspects of linear thinking and yet more. And you can imagine in the way this is super linear because it has the ability to build up linear thinking and rational thinking and logic. So, of course, the problem uh, with De Bono's indefensible attitude or stance is that he sort of attacks indirectly and never admits it, attacks symmetrical thinking. And we still think, although he takes up all these misunderstandings, we still think that we have to abandon some part of ourselves. And no wonder he got so heavily attacked when he for once tried to send us this message in this famous Guardian article will never work. We will never give up our symmetrical linear thinking. We shouldn't. But we should go into where it starts. We need to go into the source. <coughs> 
and that linear and step-by-step -step thinking we have is not linear, it's not step-by-step, -step. it doesn't have any predictive power. In very small, narrow cases, I, which I usually call forhanden cases, where you try to rearrange maybe uh, some numbers or do calculation. They're very connected to repetition with things you've done before. Yes, they could have a spice of creativity, but the true source is way behind that. And as I say, we never stop to do proper thinking, but we try to cover it up with this after effect, the shadow effect. This is the first conclusion. I will read a little bit more, and then we'll have a little bit more conclusions. So, <clears throat> this will sort of liberate us from the constraints of thinking that are two types of thinking. Um, that one thinking is strict, correct, and will lead to good results. And the other one is sort of crazy, paradoxical in nature doesn't lead to good results well in some cases and this is not the sort of thinking that is used when you become successful you are happy with your relations you have a company or you sell things you do marketing and that 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 type of thinking is completely different uh, this was the problem with Eva de Bono this is why he never really reached into the academia or even the world outside marketing and business. Business people don't care about the foundational nature of anything. If it works, they take it. But I think this could, could have been incredibly helpful to Edward de Bono. Because there are no two different types of thinking. There is just one. And we still use proper thinking, but we blur out the whole thing with this reflective consciousness thinking that is an after effect and that that thinking in itself is not helpful for us i am not implying we can stop doing it but one first step is to understand that it works afterwards and it's likely a little bit like putting one leg in front of the other and then fall over this is the problematic nature of that thinking. It stops proper thinking. It stops everything that is linear thinking. It stops everything that is step-step thinking. But it also stops at all the source of thinking. It can be compared to some sort of plaque that you have in your head, which you can literally have. And I would most definitely assume that this sort of Plaque like thinking can develop into autism, can develop into dementia, and many, many other things. But we are still using proper thinking, although we are completely unaware of it. Because we have moved our consciousness, and we talked about that when we mentioned Richard E. Lean. There has been a movement, and I clearly believe that. So does Ian McGilchrist. And the proof from fMRI and other sources, but especially fMRI, are significant. They clearly point in one direction, that we have not two different types of thinking. We have only one, but there is something else going on that blocks out understanding and awareness. And it's de detrimental to health. I am definitely sure. Can you imagine the advantages it would have been for Edward de Bono to just have one thinking and not having to go about defending or attacking anything. He could just slide into the debate as anyone else. Not having to have an opposing opposition or flee to Valletta in Malta. It would have been very, very helpful for him. From the inside, he could have softened up, not going out attacking 
because all of his books are attacks on something else. But attacks won't help. <laughs> it's knowledge. It is the only thing that can help. People don't change their opinion until they get better and more valid knowledge that works better. And demanding, and I also think about the hippie philosophers like Alan Watts that I've been criticizing before and now I get more wood. Their attacks on what they feel to be logical thinking is completely misguided. <laughs> it's just the opposite. It's as typically his take on Eastern Asian philosophy and thinking is absolutely wrong. Because he assumes that they think like we do. They don't. And that assumption is, I would say, colonial at its worst, but it's a bit harsh. But he's imperialistic. But he's also unthinking and uh, forgivable because, as Carl Freston shows, there is no way of knowing these things other than the fMRI. There's no other way. Of course, we had good use of uh, Carl Friston before, but also Anthony Cimero and James Gibson, Julian James. Richard E. Lind was very helpful for me. And we have suggested that the world is not... And you, I can't, you can't even use that word. The, the world is not constructed according to the logical mind. This is wrong because neither the mind or the world it constructs following any pattern. They are after effects. I would say everyone built differently these after effects. They're not stable as all, as all after effects. And I would say this reflective consciousness, it can be noted as certain stress, but it is easy to see on, I didn't show any other diagrams, that they are sort of friction, being out of sync, and thereby also being out of place. Because oddly enough, even though the fMRI is a functional uh, magnetic radiation inference, instrument it also shows space because without time we can't show space why is that well with functional with time temporal line we can connect what a person experience and that happens in time with uh, what he's thinking and this was the whole idea with the letters a letter series that didn't have any meaning in contrast to a letter series that had meaning And we can do this stepwise. It doesn't have to be a Zen-like koan thing. And I think it needs to be a training thing. But first, of course, this series is very important because it puts the proof. Without the proof that, sadly, Edward de Bonny was lacking, no, no change will come. No change will come. We will not go in the Alan Watts way. We will not pertain to start to eat uh, mushrooms or use cannabinoid uh, liquors or something like that to reach creativity. We simply won't do it. It will not happen. It will not ever happen. Because we are attached to our thinking for a very good reason. It's all what we have left is the after effect. Just like Plato. And he, to abandon that, he would have nothing at all. And I think our system is a survival system. It won't allow us to abandon it unless there is a convincing good proof for doing so will better everything because there is no loss here. Why clinging on to the photo when you can have a moving picture? And this is also the reason why Heraclitus has been so widely misunderstood. Because our concept of thinking won't allow the very philosophical and helpful, healthy ideas 
of Heraclitus to come to our fore. Even if we accept them, that will still seem paradoxical. But that ended today, I would say. That will never ever happen with me anymore. It was already softened up quite uh, substantially, but now I think it would never ever happen anytime more. But of course, proof is just the first step. And I think this is connected to the hand and our motor skills, because the connectivity with the body is in our doing. And this is why I repeated and repeated the fMRI. It's a moving thing, and it's deeply connected to how we move. The thinking and movement are closely connected. I wouldn't say that they're two sides of a coin, because I won't use that anymore, but they're definitely complementary. complementary. I will continue with another article, not as hard as the previous one, but still quite tough, and I'll come with an explanation later on. This is from uh, the magazine Perspectives. It's a part of Nature, which is a magazine also. Perspective is a part of Nature. www.nature.com. It's on page. 160 and written by Deborah G. Serian, Richard B. Ivory and Stefan P. Swinnen. It's called Dynamics of Hemispheric Specialization and Integration in the Context of Motor Control. Abstract behavioral and neurophysiological evidence convincingly established that the left hemisphere is dominant for motor skill, skills that are carried out with either hand or those that require the manual coordination. As well as this prioritization, we argue that specialized function of the right hemispheres are also indispensable for the realization of goal-directed behavior. All directed behavior is the clue there. As such, later, lateralization of motor function is a dynamic and multifaceted process that emerges across different time scales and is contingent on task and performer related determinants. Owing Two advances in neuroimaging techniques, coupled with clinical work, considerable progress has been made in understanding the functional roots of brain organization. Two fundamental principles have been proposed. Functional specialization, which refers to the idea that particular neural regions perform specialized computations and functional integration which implies that specific tasks require extensive interactions between specialized neural regions. It is mainly the premise of functional specialization that has received the lion's share of attention in the neurosciences as supported by evidence in favor of anatomical segregation. Conversely, the assessment of functional integration has proved to be more challenging and usually benefits from statistical methods used to infer dependency in neuro, dependencies in neural activity. These two principles must be considered as complementary when considering cortical function. <coughs> Taking a broad view, the localizationist doctrine has led to the identification of functional specialization associated with the two cerebral hemispheres. Building on the seminal ideas of Franz Gall, Paul Broca, and Carl Wernicke, presented evidence that certain language abilities 
are impaired following damage to specific regions in the left hemisphere. Brocas and Wernicke's areas in the left in inferior frontal gyrus and the left superior and middle temporal gyro, respectively. John Huglins Jackson was one of the first to make explicit that each side is responsible for specialized functions by contrasting the importance of the interior lobe of the left hemisphere with that of the posterior lobe of the right hemisphere. These idea, ideas lay the foundation for a dominant theme in the laterality literature that arose in the 20th century. We will struggle on here. Um, we're talking about the specialized localization doctrine that brain functions are localized in different areas of the brain. Still to this day, uh, almost dominant view on the brain. And John Huglings Jackson was one of the first to make explicit that each side is responsible for specialized function by contrasting the importance of the anterior lobe of the left hemisphere with that of the posterior lobe of the right hemisphere. These ideas laid for the foundation for a dominant theme in the literally, literally literature that arose in the 20th century and continues to this present day. Namely, that the left hemisphere has a dominant role in linguistic abilities, whereas the right hemisphere is responsible for visuospatial functioning. Whereas Euling Jacksons and other earlier neurologists stressed the con contralateral organization of the motor system. Hugo Liepmann highlighted and marked a symmetry between the hemispheres in terms of skilled action. Specifically, Liepmann's argued, Liepmann argued that the left hemisphere has a dominant role in the control of movement, postulating that this hemisphere contains movement formula that are intended for both sides of the body. <clears throat> 
These ideas were dramatically reinforced by the initial reports of patients who underwent the callosotomy producer for treatment of intractable epilepsy. In particular, these patients experienced difficulty producing voluntary movements with the left hand in the early months of the surgery, which suggests that such control requires trans callosal input from the left hemisphere. Today the prevalent view in neurosciences is that the specialized functions of the left hemisphere are essential for skilled movement and language. This lateralization profile is quite well established for right-handers and might be set early in development after the emergence of key motor and perceptual specialization in initial gestation. Indeed, most researchers assume that the left hemisphere specialization for movement and language associated functions are related to one another. However, the basis of these asymmetries has engendered considerable debate. One dominant hypothesis emphasizes functional connections between the cortical hand motor areas and language circuit that may have been essential for the evolution of language from manual gestures rather than vocal calls, which is supported by the robust use of gestures that typically accompany speech. Accordingly, Broca's area has been observed to be associated with various non-language motor functions such as planning, recognition and imitation of actions, as well as with syntactic operations required for the hierarchical representation of sequential behaviors. The aim of this article is to present the viewpoint that letterization of motor function is a dynamic process. Although we contend that in right-handers, the left hemisphere takes on a dominant role for the regulation of motor behavior. We also discuss the evidence that supports, supports the specialized function of the right hemisphere for motor control. Accordingly, we propose that lateralization of motor function is a versatile process during which the functional involvement of both hemispheres is not fixed, but is flexible and driven, driven by several fundamental factors. Let's start with the left hemisphere. With respect to motor behavior in humans, the issue of hemispheric specialization is closely tied to handedness and therefore linked to asymmetric brain function. Left hemisphere dominance for skilled movements has been attributed to anatomical and functional asymmetries of the primary motor cortex. and descending pathways, as well as to secondary motor and association areas. An extensive motor map contralateral to the preferred hand supports an asymmetry of MY, M1 in right-handers and probably corresponds to experience-dependent changes that begin early in development. <laughs> 
figure one, I would try to include that, but it's not really necessary. I will just make the conclusions. Figure one shows an example of M1 maps in right-handed subject when carrying out various tasks with the preferred and non-preferred hand. As illustrated, the different actions identified as spatially segre segregated depolar sources are more dispersed in the left than in the right hemisphere. An experiential component to this asymmetry is consistent with the fact that there is considerable plasticity of M1 maps following pathological or traumatic changes, as well as during motor learning and consibulation. The more extensive connectivity of the left M1 with associated corticospinal tracts is further supported by new MRI techniques that correlate functional and anatomical information using functional MRI. Once more we have it. And diffusion tensor imagining. Furthermore, on the basis of transcranial magnetic stimulation data, it has been suggested that the excitability of the cort corticospinal system of right-handers is higher in the left than in the right hemisphere. The asymmetry of secondary motor and association areas, which probably reflects a consequence of specialized regions implementing distinct functions, is particularly evident from clinical work. Patients with left hemisphere lesions, especially of parietal areas, are likely to show impairments in producing skilled actions with either hand, whereas comparable right hemisphere lesions produce deficits that are largely restricted to a contralateral hand. Further evidence for hemispheric asymmetry of association areas is provided by new imaging work in healthy participants. Figure 2a shows the greater involvement of the left compared with the right premotor and parietal areas in higher order aspects of action that are related to movements, movement complexity. Overall, one can say that the literature underscores the involvement of the left hemisphere in movement organization and selection. <coughs> Figure 2b, as well as motor imagery and learning, Various hypotheses have been offered as a functional basis for this asymmetrical pattern, including a role in sequential behavior, B manual coordination, tool use, evaluation of the body state, and interpretation of perceived action. Furthermore, a left hemisphere specialization for temporal processing, at least for sequential movements, has been proposed which fits with the role in spoken language as well as sign language. The right hemisphere, the role of the right hemisphere in motor organization is less well defined. With respect to M1, there is evidence for a reduced representation in the right compared with the left hemisphere in right handers, which releases to decreased dexterity of the less preferred hand. Regarding association areas, functional specialization related to higher order planning do not seem to be strongly developed. 
all the spatial response selection has been linked with the right hemisphere. This restricted involvement might be due to the right hemisphere requiring strong external cues to select a particular motor representation from various options or to a selection mechanism that involves mainly exploratory processing of novel situations. The latter argument concerning novel situations would be in line with a theory of hemispheric control that assumes that the left hemisphere controls open loop aspects of the moment based on well-established motor programs, whereas the right hemisphere is crucial for closed loop aspects of the movement, dependent on sensory feedback. However, recent research in patients do not support this clear dichotomy of hemispheric symmetry. Instead, this work suggests that the separation of different components of reaching movements on the basis of open and closed loop processing is relative rather than absolute. Hmm. Alternatively, it has been proposed that the left hemisphere controls limb trajectory where the right hemisphere regulate limb position and posture. This premise is in agreement with patient data that show differential effects of left and right hemispheric lesions on the initial and final phases of aiming movements. At present, both hypotheses are considered to be convergent. Open loop hemisphere specialization is limited to feed forward specification of task dynamics whereas closed-loop right hemisphere specialization includes sensory mediated mechanism that control final lean position. Nonetheless, various lines of evidence convincingly support a dominant role for the right hemisphere in various spatial functions such as spatial memory, learning and orienting, it has been suggest suggested that this right-sided dominance is due to preferential coding, encoding of global features in contrast to specialization of the left hemisphere for processing local features. Computationally, the distinction possibly result from the differential sensitivity of the of the hemispheres to spatial frequency information. That is, amplification of low spatial frequencies underscores information at the global level. Whereas intensification of high spatial frequencies highlights information at the local level. Alternatively, a right hemisphere specialization for spatial functions might relate to its involvement in the control of spatial attention for both the left and the right visual fields. Or a monitoring function that especially becomes apparent in conflict situations as when experience a mismatch between motor intentions proprioception and or visual feedback. Task and performer related influences. The previous section summarized various hypotheses concerning how the cerebral hemispheres provide differential contributions to the control of skilled actions. As outlined, some functions are lateralized to one hemisphere or the other which might be beneficial in terms of reducing conduction delays. 
or downgrading in interference from incompatible processes. Here, we propose that the relative involvement of each hemisphere in motor behavior depends on task and performer related characteristics. This implies that several factors dynamically shape the contribution of each hemisphere. On the one hand, this involves the type and complexity of the movements. On the other hand, the skill level, the CNS status and attentional focus of the performer will also influence the manner in which the two hemispheres contribute to the control of movement. Task relating characteristics. Movement type processing evidently has an important role in the mechanism and control of skilled actions. In particular, sequential representations and their resources are associated with the left hemisphere. Independent on the performing hand. In view of this, the left hemisphere may be especially involved in the planning of sequential acts that implicate notable response selection, preparation and or retrieval. For goal-directed reaching, each hemisphere is proposed to contribute in a distinct manner to controlling controlling the specification of trajectory and final position. The distinction is due to the left hemisphere's contribution in the planning of the limb dynamics, whereas the right hemisphere is essential for specifying the final position of reaching movement through sensory regulation. The contribution of each hemisphere is also modulated by movement complexity. Whereas a simple movement such as unimanimal finger tapping is organized by a local neural circuit, more complex actions such as those involving a sequence of finger movements engage distributed, often bilateral networks. In this respect, recruitment of both hemispheres might be affected by augmented attentional or executive con control requirements. Or by the use of operations that are specialized in each hemisphere. It is assumed that the interhemispheric pathways allow for relevant coupling or decoupling of information. That input is indeed communicated between both hemispheres is evident, for example, from motor transfer studies, which address it, addresses intermanual information transmission when a specific task is practiced with one hand. In general, performance benefits are found to occur in the trained as well as the untrained hand. Goldberg and et al. proposed that the right hemisphere processing is driven by the external environment, whereas the left hemisphere processing is guided by internal representation. We recognize that, don't we, from Ian McKilchrist. <laughs>
This line of thinking is consistent with observations from patients with spatial neglect that is ignoring an area of your world. Following right parietal injury, who show a severe shift of exploratory movements toward the right side, that becomes markedly attenuated when goal-directed movements are performed. It suggests that both types of action necess necessitates differential input or supporting processes with a distinct contribution from both hemispheres. These functional differences between the two sides would suggest a right to left shift of hemispheric importance as expertise develops. Indeed, skill development is often associated with a partial transition from externally to internally generated movement control. For example, when learning to accomplish a difficult bimanual task, activation in the right hemisphere decreases over time, whereas left hemisphere activation become more prominent. So as you learn a task in the beginning, the right hemisphere is strained, and once the repetition, the iterations, are sufficient, it goes over to the more compulsory repetitive left hemisphere. The former might be due to a reduced requirement for monitoring spatial features of the movements, whereas the latter probably relates to an augmented involvement of a consolidated representation. It's fair to say uh, uh, the more you repeat something, the more a representation we follow. Now we're starting to understand what is a representation. It's fair to say that the representation takes space, could be compared to taking space. Once a movement is being learnt, has been learnt, it will take space as a representation in the left hemisphere. The CNS status of the performer is linked to change in operational strategy due to the particular neural circumstances. For example, after injury, cortical regions associated with bilateral control, such as premotor cortex, may take on enhanced motor processing responsibilities and as such have a crucial role in recovery of function. This implies that both hemispheres are endowed with functional capabilities that can be exploited under specific conditions. And supports the idea that neural involvement for task production is malleable although there is evidence that motor deficits differ after left versus right hemisphere damage, this issue requires further detailed evaluation with particular consideration of the site and the extent of neural damage as well as task constraints and handedness. Finally, attention can modulate the involvement of the two hemispheres. In particular, hemispheric biases may change as spatial attentiveness shifts between global and local levels of representation that rely on right and left hemisphere processes, respectively, or between motor and non-motor demands of self-produced actions for which directed motor attention enhances selection of the representation. <coughs>
The findings described above show that the task demands, the task demands and the characteristics of the performer have powerful effects on the processing requirements for movement and movement control and may bias hemispheric asymmetries and interhemispheric interactions. It illustrates that a dynamic balance between the existing constraints induces certain operational modes. Sorry. For example, whereas global spatial guidance, especially relevant for novel and unexplored actions, is associated with the right hemisphere, representational processing that occurs on the basis of experience-based planning is more effectively mediated by the left hemisphere. This implies that the functional contribution of both hemispheres is flexibly driven. It is this flexibility that underlies skilled and adaptive motor behavior. In this respect, the examination of motor tasks such as tapping and finger sequencing, which are often used in experimental designs, might have biased research outcomes in favor of distinct, primary left hemisphere processing requirements. Accordingly, future work should focus on a wider range of tasks with different degrees of motor complexity. To delineate the proficiency of each hemisphere in movement control. Information gating and integration. If certain functions are lateralized to one hemisphere or the other, then efficient gating of information is essential for movements that draw on these functions. Many of these interactions occur via the corpus, corpus callosum, allowing for the transfer of premotor feedback, error, and attention related to in input. This communication between the hemispheres involves functional inhibition as well as fac facilitation. Inhibitory interactions are thought to be crucial during the preparations of unilateral actions to counteract the production of default mirror movements. That is involuntary movements on one hand that is in company the voluntary actions of the other hand. From a lateralization viewpoint, there is evidence to suggest that in right-handed handers inhibitory effects between both motor cortices are greater from the left to the right hemisphere than vice versa. <coughs> this type of functional distinction could contribute to a hemispheric differences in motor control and probably emerges in early childhood, during which certain inhibitory processes in the hemispheres assume an asymmetri asymmetrical development course. A sort of conclusion and then I would put in my summary. Conclusions. A principal phenomena of human brain regulation is lateralization of function. Traditionally, emphasis has been on left hemisphere supremacy for language and motor control versus right hemisphere dominance for spatial representation and attention. <coughs> 
all those specialized areas are probably predetermined. It is through the combination of interregional interactions that coherent behavior is achieved. In this respect, we have proposed that the strength of functional connectivity patterns parallels of increased resilience on left hemisphere representation, which accordingly support a refined motor repertoire. Very important. The refinement of the motor repertoire equals thinking. And it's also handling the both contradictory components of our system, our climb bottle, so to speak, with the world. I think you clearly see now the false thinking, or whatever you call it, I'll come up with a better name, is bound to think be real because we all intermove in the same world. And in this interactivity, you will continue to be, believe in that thinking that you have, will achieve things, planning, actions, and so things, because in the repetition of the left hemisphere, which is already ingrained, your reactions are already put in place from childhood and you don't notice that your thinking doesn't achieve anything. And this is why I call this out of sync. Your actions come first and they are ingrained. Your absolute uh, connection to the world, which is obviously, I don't have to argue for that, we're not living in a vat, we're not transcendental. This tricks you into thinking that your thinking has an effect. It tricks you to mistaken what you don't have for something that you think you have. And it also tricks you into wanting that more, to refine it like Plato and all others. The whole, I would say the whole discourse of the Western philosophy is seeking that desperately, desperately, not gaining it. It is like it's already lost in childhood or it's also lost in history. But obviously, proper thinking has to be effective in the world. You see that because we are learned thinking from interacting with the world. It's more that the left hemisphere takes, takes over with its already imbued actions. Less refined though, and they do not develop over time. Moreover, it is through an active interplay of neural processing, mainly via callosal projections, callosal is what's connecting the two hemispheres, that the transfer of information for sensimotor integration, intention, decision-making, and response preparation is supported. This processing is not static, but is dynamically driven by task and performer-related determinants across various time scales, which together shape the overall motor behavior. Therefore, the pattern of hemispheric asymmetry that underlies movement organization is multifaceted and more complex than the simple dichotomy of function. So you see, we can have function in the world, but we can also have something completely other. And I would call that the potential for action. This processing is not static, but dynamically driven by task and performer-related determinants across various timescales, very important. The goal direction of the brain is very important, and the whole world. And of course, all Western philosophers have all missed out on the why question, as pointed out so aptly by Martin Heidegger. Until recently, our understanding of the brain areas involved in the organization of skilled actions was almost exclusively provided by studies of patients with brain injuries, in whom deficits in performance were associated with the site of pathology. 
This literature emphasized that left and right hemisphere injury can selectively disrupt specific cognitive motor functions and has yielded important insight into how the brain represents and regulates motor behavior. These findings have been confirmed, updated, and extended by Functional Imaging Studies, FMRI. Although this research further underscores that specific functions are preferentially implemented by one hemisphere or the other, it also suggests that there is more complex organization that involves a distributed engagement of multiple neural regions for successful task performance. Therefore, a crucial problem for future research is to explore the relative contribution of hemispheres regions across various timescales and task demands. It is particularly the study of these dynamics that require further effort because it offers a window into the nature of interhemispheric processing. This will also promote, promote the unique but too often neglected processing capabilities of the right hemisphere in movement regulation. These insights are not only decisive for theories of motor control in health and disease, but also for advancing rehabilitative interventions to improve motor disability due to neural damage. Well, here you see is a connection with Gibson's affordances and Tony Shimiro. Here we see how the brain in the start when learning, do creative things, when we do complicated things, the right hemisphere is involved and strained even. Once the iterations become more and more and more, that goes over as a representation into the left hemisphere. I think this is the best explanation I heard of what is a representation. Now we can skip this idea of uh, thinking it's just words, like in let the neck be free so that the head can go up, upward, forward and upward, and the uh, back lengthening and widening. These are actually representation when performed correctly. Isn't that interesting? So you can start with the right hemisphere, establish the patterns of action, and then you can automatically via the vest. Uh, left hemisphere, you can actually put them into action whenever you want. When reading this paper, I cannot do it, but I will be able after training more and more. I can do it when I talk now. So it becomes a representation and therefore it can constantly be used in a beneficial manner, both for improving manner of moving and thinking. Thinking is actually included in this, and if it, this is excellent. Much to the help of Jay Gibson and Tony Shimiro, of course, affordances. But now I clearly understand what Wittgenstein was aiming at. Clear projected thinking is logical and it's symmetrical, but it comes from a place which encompasses both the symmetrical and non-symmetrical. This is important to think, but the stale product the left representation of thinking is not active. It doesn't do anything else. It is like a neutered horse. It cannot reproduce new thoughts. It cannot achieve anything. And of course, you still have creativity, but it's bound to be in a forehand place, at the workplace or something like that. But you lost your capabilities to be creative. And this is a proven fact. So now we have more on our feet to defend the thesis of Richard E. Lind, Martin Heidegger, Heraclitus. It is stemming from FMRI. How marvelous. Well, I better end there. I have a call coming up. Thank you very much. And bye-bye. <laughs>